Um, hi, my name is Don Hill. I was born on Six Nations um, Reserve um, to a Mohawk father and a non-native non mother. Uh, in 1949, I'm a Mohawk of the Turtle Clan. I take after my father's side. Um, I think when we talk about experiences of children at the at the Mush Hole, the Mohawk Institute, it's best to start with understanding the background. Because I had a very happy childhood, right up until I went to the Mush Hole, and I had a very came from a very loving family. Um, our mother was a good cook. She always did canning and stuff. And our father was a hunter, but he also worked part time in Brantford at the, at the cockshit factory. And um, we were allowed to be children. We were never spanked. We slept sometimes three or four in a bed. <laughs> we didn't have much. We had a big, uh, a little house with um, basically just open, three beds in it, and a kitchen on one side. And um, but we were all happy. Our mother and father loved us put their arms around us all the time and let us be children playing outside, uh, wandering through the bush by ourselves. My older brother, he would always take me with him. <clears throat> He's about a year and a half older than I was and we'd swing on the vines and make bows and arrows, um, you know, those things that never really worked and, and just had fun out in the bush. We were never afraid. We were never afraid not to come home or, you know, if we stayed out too late. When it got dark, he could come home or if he got hungry. Um, and we were never really ever hungry because our mother was um, always did a lot of canning and she always uh, did a full meal. We'd sit down and um, I know that we were, um, now that I think about it, we were probably kind of poor because our dad had told me one time I wasn't to feed the cat because the, uh, from the table because the kids needed that food. So, but like I said, it was a very happy family and he would sit us on his knee when he came home sometimes, a couple on each knee, we were just little ones. Um, because there were seven in our immediate family, um, I think the youngest was three at that time when we went to the mush hole, up to probably my oldest sister, probably was about ten and a half, maybe eleven, somewhere in there, and uh, the, the seven us ranged, I was kind of most of the middle. But my mother also had a previous uh, marriage. And she had seven children in that family, which is kind of important because it's part of my story as well. So one day, my father had passed away. Um, and so our mother was left with us four kids, and she was a stay-at-home mom. And she tried to look after us, but because of all the, the tension of uh, not having the same facilities that we have today to help her um, to look after us and to get on with raising us, she had a nervous breakdown. And so... Our oldest sister, um, in the other half of the family, tried to take us in, and um, but uh, because she had, um, I guess, her own family started and little kids of her own, putting another seven kids on her was a little bit of a hardship. So she did put us in, in the residential school, the Mohawk Institute, and that's how we got there. So, <clears throat> but life really changed from that time that we entered the residential school. And I know that my, my older sister, she had to look after the little one that was only five. The two little, other little ones, I don't know where they went at the time. But um, they went up with my older sister, and she looked after them. And so there was in the one dorm, my sister and I, and the boys were on the other side. And the very first time that I went into the dorm was late at night. My sister Roberta was with me. And um, so the officer said, you sleep there, and to my, my sister, you go sleep over there. Because we were little, we were on the lower bunks. And um, so she left. It was kind of scary, because it was dark, and there was about 60, 60 kids in there, all in bunk beds. And um, So my sister, younger sister, she says, can I come and sleep with you? Well, that was no different from being home. Because, like I said, we slept quite often all in the same bed. And so I told her to come sleep with me. And so the officer comes back, and, and by the way, I call them an officer, not a house mother, because I didn't find there was anything motherly about them. Anyway, so she comes back in, and she says to three little girls on the opposite side of the dorm, get down here. I heard you talking. I guess we weren't allowed to talk. Anyway, so those three little girls came down, and they were crying, lining, lining up in front of her. And then there's my sister and I, and she looks in our direction and said, what are you two doing in the same bed? Get out here. We're like in a really stern, cross voice. 
And uh, like I said, we weren't really talked like that uh, in, our, in our family. It was always just explained in a gentle manner. Anyway, <clears throat> so we knew something bad was going to happen to us. And sure enough, that was the first time we'd ever been strapped in our life. And she had a, a great big leather belt. And you, have, by the time she strapped us on three times on each hand, and she wasn't gentle, we had big welts from the crook, crook of your arm right to your fingertips. And that's one of the rules we then learned, that we weren't to sleep together. And most of the time, those were how we learned the rules of living at the Mushel, was you did it wrong, you got the strap, you know, or smacked in the head, or pulled by the ear, or something like that. <clears throat> and so that was basically our introduction. But down in the playroom, and I can't remember where we were assigned numbers, but my number was 54, Rob's was number 34. And um, the officers didn't call you by your name, they called you by your number. So if they wanted to speak to me, they would say, 54, come here, you know, that type of thing. And so you learned your number. You learned everybody's number. But you also learned their names. Because when kids are left to their own devices, they talk and they share. And so we did. We, we found out where everybody else lived and where they came from, what reserve, uh, what tribe basically they came from. And so over those years that we were there, uh, we made connections, we made friends. I have a lifelong friend. She's been my friend. I met her at the Mush Hole from Moravian Town. We've been friends for like 63 years, I think, because uh, she was also young when she went there. And um, anyway, so... You be, it, it becomes very impersonal when you are dealing with the officers. <clears throat> and um, I have to stress, it was also, there, wasn't off, there was times when nobody was looking after us, and that's when other things happened. So if the officer wasn't there, and there's always, there's always mean kids in a group, and, and there were, and so they would bully you and well, I, I remember the first time it happened to me I was shoved into a, a ring of girls and they were all around me and they shoved another little girl in the ring with me and told us we had to fight I didn't want to fight that little girl I'm sure she didn't want to fight me we were just little and like I said at our house those things didn't happen you know and so when we didn't fight they kept pushing us into each other so that we would crash into each other you know and, and then eventually we, we figured we had to hit each other which we did and um, <clears throat> that happened to me twice, but I also witnessed it several times with other kids. So you always kind of learn to kind of uh, watch your back. I made a couple of friends, and the three of us would um, uh, kind of stick together and help each other out. And that one was my friend that I had had for 63 years. And um, so it was kind of like um, there was always tension. There was always friction. There was always... Uh, you had to be really aware of your surroundings. And um, you kind of learn to be violent. You learn to be uncaring about other people's feelings and stuff. And um, I know that I, um, I have to tell this part because it was very much part of my experience. No, my sister was molested there by the minister. I wasn't. I had a different experience. So... One day I was just feeling really sad because nobody ever hugged you. Nobody ever said anything really nice to you. And I was just sad because I remembered my home life and my, my parents. And so one day I was just feeling really sad. I guess nowadays you'd call it a, a depression, a childhood depression of some sort. Anyway, so I was crying my, my eyes out on the bench there one day and in the afternoon. And Miss Tawn, she was one of the officers. I didn't really mind her. Um, she came and asked me what was wrong with me. And as a kid, you can't express your feelings um, so that they would understand. So I didn't tell her anything, and I, and I cried myself to sleep. And, and in my, I had a dream. I'm not saying it was a vision, but in my dream, there was Jesus sitting on, was not sitting, but standing on top of the, the dining room roof, looking down at me on the bench. And he told me that he would always look after me. And I believe that, because immediately after he said that to me, there was this whole wave of, of peace and love and goodness washed right through me in a physical wave. I remember it as plain as day, and it's lasted all my life. Anyway, so I got up off that bench, and um, I felt much better. Never turned into a saint <laughs> or an angel or anything else. I was still mischievous. 
um, uh, because I heard I was. But anyway, so that kind of saw me through that life at the mush hole, like where you lined up to go to bed, you lined up to go to the, the dining room, you lined up to go to school, you lined up to brush your teeth, all of those things. It was just became a, a ritual every day. I, I used to wonder, will my life ever change? Will I, when will I grow up? And when, well, where will I be when I grow up? Because we heard when you were 16, you're out on your own. And I thought, where am I going to live? And, and nobody thought children would worry about that stuff. But I did, and I bet you other kids did. And so there was no counseling. There was no, um, you know, um, direction on how you should live when you get older or anything like that. And, and so it was like those things, I think, worried a lot of the kids. And so we lived our days in and out like that. And, and some of the good times, and I have to tell you about some of the good times too, because not everything was bad, bad. Miss um, Tong would read us, like on a rainy day like today, um, she would sit us in the, in the playroom there and read us Hans Christian Andersen fairy tales. I loved listening to her read. And, and sometimes she'd take us uptown to a movie on a Saturday morning or whatever, or a walk to Mohawk Park or Lions Park or something that was a change of scenery for us little kids. And um, so I remember seeing at the movies like uh, The Ten Commandments, Cinderella, I think Ben-Hur, all of those good things. The, the time machine was the scariest one, but um, that was a change for us too. you know. And she did those kind of things. I think I can still count to ten in German, because she always counted to us in um, German uh, all the way along. And, um, but, I mean, she could be very strict, but I, I found her the most, um, well, she never hugged us or anything like that, but she seemed to be the more caring one, if you can call it caring, of all of the officers. Most of them, I think, just wanted to strap us. And I, I always used to get the strap quite a bit, um, because I think I was a little mischievous. But, hey, water under the bridge after a while. I, I outgrew all of that stuff. But anyway, so you, you learn to do those things. Oh, and one, one oh, I think every summer we went to Christian Island uh, for the kids who never, ever went home. And we were, both Roberta and I were never, never went home. And there was about um, maybe 45 of us all, maybe something like that. And they'd bus us all the way up to, to Christian Island, which was uh, another reserve. And so every day we, we went swimming in that beautiful, clear water sandy bottom, we'd go on hikes, had better food. I don't ever remember getting a strap up there. But always we had to come back in, the, in September to come back here. And um, uh, so life went on like that. There's probably other things I should tell you, but I, I really want to focus on the fact that um, there were other impacts. When we went to a foster home one Christmas in 1961, because we were there from 1957 to 1961, um, <clears throat> and so Roberta and I were sent off to this foster home. And, uh, and she was a really good cook. They were good to us as kids, and they lived on a farm, and so there were cows and chickens, and we got to swing in the barn, and they had a big hill behind the house where we could slide, you know, they had sleighs and stuff, and we were, we were able to be kids again. And um, so, um, I think it was kind of a shock to her that first Christmas. Um, my sister Roberta had something I wanted. And at the mush hole, you just took it, or you hit him and took it. So when she wouldn't give it up, I punched her in the face, gave her a bloody nose, and took whatever it was. I can't even remember what it was now. And um, this is the, the house mother, I mean the foster mother. She goes, what is wrong with you? How could you do that to your sister? She was just absolutely flabbergasted. But, you know, if she had understood where we came from and our background, she might have been a little more, um, given me more guidance about how not to treat her. And, but my, my sister did the same thing. One day I had a brush and she wanted it. She picked up a chair because I wouldn't give it to her, hit me across the back, and I gave her the, well, she took the brush. But those are kind of things that, that was everyday things for us, you know, like being violent. But, and she asked me one day too, what... When is your birthday? Oh, I hadn't a clue, because nobody ever celebrated birthdays here. So I had no idea I made up a birthday. July the 5th, I told her. So a couple, I guess a couple of months or a month later, she got the paperwork on us, and she called me a ninny and said, whatever made you think your birthday was July the 5th? Again, she didn't understand our background. And she said, oh, your birthday's September the 27th. And so they started celebrating uh, birthdays for us after that. And I think the bigger impact, even of that, 
was the fact that when we went to the public school system, it was such a shock. Nobody beat on us. Nobody did anything mean to us. They were all really nice to us. Uh, the kids were just awesome, you know, and uh, helped us out, and we learned to play sports with them, and there was, there was none of that um, aggression. And so Rob and I knew that we had, we had to change our ways if we were going to function in this new society to us, back like how it was when we were kids. You know, there was none of that, that violence. And so we did. We were way behind in our schooling as well. And so we practice every night, you know, our multiplication facts, our spelling, and trying to read. And there I finally learned how to read, which was just awesome because I always wanted to read. And I think they must have taken some time to make sure that I understood how to read at that public school. And, um, <clears throat> and so I became an avid reader. I am today. Anyway, so life went on there. And things were really good. We both made new friends, got to stay at people's houses over the weekend. And um, we knew we had to change. We had to change our attitude and our way of dealing with other people. And we did. And I think that's what was a, a big thing that changed both of us. Um, definitely for the better, because you wouldn't get very far in life if you, if you kept that up. Anyway, so things got a little scary after a bit as we got to be teenagers. My friend that I told you about for 63 years, she even came to the same um, um, foster, foster home with us. And a couple of other, three other girls from the mush hole here also came. And when we got there, there were three boys from the mush hole there. And so uh, I think it was the start of the 60s school, you know, where they were farming kids out all over the place. And, and because we stayed and all these other kids came. But things were turning a little bit um, not for the good uh, as we got to be teenagers because there was two men in the house. And uh, one was the, the father and one was the um, old, older son who still lived at home. I think he had to be in his probably late 30s, maybe early 40s. I'm not too sure. But... Um, they start getting uh, kind of aggressive with us girls, uh, sexually aggressive. And so when Barbie came, that's my friend Barb, um, she came, she says, we have to call the CAS. And so I said, but we're not supposed to use the phone. They told us when they weren't home, you are not allowed to use the phone. And I wouldn't have. I had been so conditioned to listen and to, you know, do what I was told. But Barb had been around a few foster homes and uh, other things. So she says, no. I'm going to phone them. So we had the old crank phone, you know, you crank it up and get the operator. And, and CAS came out that day and t told the men they had to get out of the house. And then they found us another foster home. And so we had three foster homes all together. But I, I really want to deal with, after that, like I did get my grade 12. I didn't know that I could have gone on as a native person. I didn't know my rights. Um, I, I really loved school. I loved high school. But when they told us, well, when you're 18, you got to get out and look after yourself. So when I was 18, I got a job in Toronto and, and um, looked after myself, got my own apartment with a couple other girls, and Rob was one of them for a while, my sister and brother. Um, and so we did look after ourselves. But then after a while, Rob wanted to come home, so she got her grade 12 the following year, and then she worked for a while with me in Toronto at the same place, and, and then she wanted to come home. Well, then after a while, I thought, well, Maybe I should go home, you know. Um, so when I was in my early 20s, I came home. But I, I didn't find I was really accepted um, because I was different. I didn't know my culture. I really didn't know my family. I didn't know cousins and aunts and uncles and the, even the protocol. Uh, you know, I didn't know anything about Longhouse or, or, or any of the teachings and stuff like that. And, and so I felt I was kind of ostracized. <laughs> and um, so then I, I thought, I'm going to move away. So I did. I moved to, to Winnipeg. I had a job in, in Brantford here with this company, and they let me transfer to um, Winnipeg as their office manager. So I went out there for, like, I think three years I lived out there. Oh, and, and my, um, in my year that I stayed home, or a year and a half that I stayed home, I met this warrior guy who I thought was big and strong and powerful, which he was. And then I tried to live with him. We had a little baby girl. And then I realized, you might be big and strong, but you don't really have the kinds of things that I want in my life. I left him. 
and um, went on my own. I thought, well, I don't want my little daughter growing up with that attitude. <laughs> Sorry, guys, attitude. Anyway, <clears throat> so then I, I, after that, I moved to um, Edmonton, same company. They transferred me over there as the office manager and paid me a good bonus to go out there and teach people to, to run the office. But then I ended up staying. I think I stayed there for four years. <clears throat> Eventually, I came home. And so when I got back home again after that, I, um, I was supply teaching because I didn't have a job because I quit that time. And, and uh, one of the principals and one of the teachers said, have you ever thought about being a teacher? And I said, I don't think I could do that kind of stuff. Well, why don't you go to Thunder Bay? They're, they're having, um, Lakehead's having an orientation. You go up there and see if you, if you like it or not. And I didn't have anything else to do that summer, so I went. And lo and behold, I loved teaching and became a teacher. I had a BA, B.Ed., and, and really loved the North. I learned Ojibwe rather than Mohawk <clears throat> and um, had to teach that in school to the little ones, grade one and two, before they got a real first, first uh, language speaker. Um, so I had to teach French, too, because I had that in high school. So I had to teach grade four and five French. So there was, a, like all of these experiences, I, I say add it to my character. <clears throat> and so um, I um, felt that I, I, I stayed up north for 13 years. My daughter eventually came home. She didn't want to live up north with me. She wanted to know her dad. So I let her go live with her dad because she was getting a little out of hand as a 12-year-old, 13-year-old. And so she came home. And she eventually had started having children. I didn't know the, the grandchildren. The first little girl um, she had, she didn't really take to me. She didn't know me. She knew the other grandma who lived on the reserve still. And so I was kind of jealous over that. And so, um, but I didn't want to come home without a job. So one year there was a, a job opening. My daughter called me and she said, there's a job opening down here for a grade eight teacher. So I went for an interview. I eventually came home, left from up north and um, got a job here. Found a whole different batch of people who didn't, who were really um, practicing a good mind and all of those other things because uh, when I first came home I felt that they didn't want me around and the kids were kind of, said I was a city girl, that type of stuff and didn't take to me too much, that's why I moved away. But when I came back I found a whole new crowd of really caring people, teachers who um, knew so much, you know, and helped guide me through my teaching experience down here, which was kind of rough at the, at the first because I wasn't really used to um, the culture. I wasn't used to uh, any of the things that went on down there. And, and But then I, I eventually fit in and, and eventually retired. But I kind of want to also stress when I think about, like, what I went through, what all the children went through when they came here, how did that impact the whole community? How did that impact families? I mean, because you're, you're, you're learning to be rough and miserable and, and violent and, you know, uncaring here. And yet they farm you back out into the community and expect you to be an angel, expect you to have a good mind, and expect you to be the perfect citizen. And when I thought of that as an older person, because I didn't think of that as a young person, I thought, well, look at all the generations all of the generations that went through the mush hole. Generation after generation. And now, like whole families, they're, they're um, dysfunctional, they can be, but I think the younger generations are now um, moving past some of that, not everybody, cause, because it's not easy to just change a whole society. And I found that's, that's kind of what we're trying to do here, you know, like change um, attitudes within our community, but with outside communities, within families, <clears throat> bringing that family unit back together again and showing the young kids that, yeah, things can change, but we have to work at it. And, and um, so I think... If we all work together, if we all educate our, our young kids, my youngest granddaughter, I mean my oldest granddaughter rather, she went through the Ongwe Hongwe language program at Polytech and got a degree. So she now can teach Mohawk or Cayuga. And um, I thought, 
That's so I was really positive. I'm really proud of that granddaughter of mine. If she speaks it in the house, she's teaching the little ones. Um, not as probably because I don't understand it. My, I know my daughter does a little bit of the understanding of it, but because I didn't take Mohawk and I learned Ojibwe, I have a hard time with those $50 words that Mohawks, you know, use. Um, I'm proud of the fact that she took the initiative to learn that. She, she really focuses on the culture and uh, um, the understanding of it, although we sometimes get into arguments about um, the church. Well, she says, oh, you, you, went to the, you go to the church. I said, actually, I don't. But I know the experience that I had was a spiritual one. I don't care what you call that higher being, whether you call him the creator or God or whatever. I said, our, our, um, our beliefs are very much the same. To practice a good mind, to treat others well, like you want to be treated, you know, and take care of the earth. Those are all things that both teach. I mean, you get corrupt people in both um, cultures, you know, and, but it's up to us to keep that focus on doing the good things. And that's it. <laughs>